Hi, folks. Today, I have a very, very, very special guest, and I have a Dr. Richard Walden with me, and he needs no introduction. Dr. Richard OBE is an officer of the Order of the British Empire. He's a, a professor of supply chain strategy in, in Grangefield. He's a top 10 uh, influencer globally, and he's a subject matter expert when it comes to supply chain risk and resilience. And today, this is the top, a very specific topic we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, the, the origins and the history of his research and uh, what has been happening on this topic since last decade and why it is so important and pertinent right now because he's been going into a lot of big news channels like, you know, BBC, Sky and talking about this specific topic, right? So thank you, Dr. Richard, for joining me. I know you're super busy. You are probably <laughs> the biggest celebrity right now on the, on the supply chain world. <laughs> So I feel almost honored and nervous and excited for having you in the supply chain. So, sir, how are you today? Oh, I'm very well. And after that introduction, I can't wait to hear myself speak, actually. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you very much for your very generous introduction. Sure. So I, I think, yeah, it, it's great. And, uh, you know, my goal is very much about challenging and inspiring business and supply chain leaders to innovate. So, you know, I often say that innovation is taking ideas which are new to you and creating economic, social or environmental value. And um, I made the big mistake of doing a LinkedIn newsletter on supply chain innovation. I thought my mum might subscribe to it and a couple of other friends. And it's already got over 10,000 subscribers. So that's a bit of a bit of a bit of a bind. But really, the um, the key thing that we want to look at is just resilience, because, hey, what a mad world we're currently living in in terms of supply chain resilience. I mean, today eh, across all the news is the fact that we've got a container vessel blocking the Suez Canal and they've got to sort that one out. But we've also had the pandemic. Uh, we've had all sorts of uh, challenges uh, to the supply chain. So I, I guess a good place to start is to start at the beginning. Would that be useful? Yeah, absolutely. I think let's start with the you know beginning, especially I know you, I'm, I'm going to request you to present your uh, quickly the temple of supply chain res resilience and explain to people the building blocks. But while you, before you do that, just give us the history and your okay, yeah, as a researcher, right? Because you are the leading researcher in that space. And I mean, in the, the, the you know, all the COVID and all the pandemic couldn't be a better time for, you know, in a very sad way, could not be a better time to, to understand your research and why it is so important right now. OK, lovely. So, uh, I mean, first of all, I suppose just to give a quick overview of uh, where I, uh, I came from, my, my first degree was actually in materials engineering. And so when I left um, university, you know, as a 21 year old, keen young uh, sort of uh, graduate, um, I then went into industry. So I started uh, my career in industry and um, I actually worked in the uh, brick industry. I was a production manager, manufacturing systems engineer. I was also um, working in metal refining. And then I accidentally fell into academia and I joined uh, the Warwick Manufacturing Group, which is very famous. Um, my boss was uh, Professor Kumar Bhattacharya, who became Lord Bhattacharya, sadly uh, uh, died a couple of years ago, but real somebody who is very much a game changer. And I joined that group, believe it or not, and I think there were 70 of us when I joined. And when I moved on to Cranfield in about 1998, there was about 500 people in the group. So it was just a massive growth there. And it's still an incredibly well-recognized group uh, globally. And uh, part of the reasoning for going to Cranfield is, is just, you know, Cranfield's reputation in supply chain, uh, really, really strong. And it's very much end to end. You know, we, we cover every, we have specialists in every aspect of the supply chain, not just say manufacturing, but, you know, uh, shipping, freight, all sorts. You know, we've got people who are specializing in that area. But let's get back to my, uh, some of my, uh, where my, career really started. So I started, of course, you know, I came in from industry. And uh, one of the things I realized I was a chartered engineer was that in universities, for some strange reason, they're incredibly insistent that you have to have a doctorate, you know, and if you like a, a PhD is, is really a, um, you could say it's very much a research training 
um, uh, uh, course. And I sort of casually signed up to this thing, uh, thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do a uh, PhD while I'm working here. And my and I think the original application was all around um, just looking at it was about inventory control in production environments. And then I started to move into uh, supply chains. A lot of my research at that time was really building on the work by Jay Forrester, which is all about demand amplification, which then got rebranded in the in about 1997 to be called the bullwhip effect. I was also looking at things called parallel interactions, which were rebranded. And I think we're talking about the ripple effect now, yeah. but also very importantly, I was looking at deterministic chaos. Now deterministic chaos, you know, chaos theory, this is about how very small changes in one place can create a, a, a massive difference in another place. And what my actual research actually showed was, was that uncertainty could be generated basically because of some of the algorithms, some of the equations that we actually use within the control of inventory within supply chains under certain circumstances start to generate uh, what we call um, just random peaks in demand. OK, so there's three areas that fed off each other. You'd have these parallel interactions feeding off, if you like, demand amplification or the bullwhip effect, which would then create um, chaos, <laughs> which uh, everybody knows. But sometimes on its own, without anything else, you'd have, you know, a system which was seemed to be totally uh, stable would create the what I called chaotic spikes. Literally, you'd have a system which was totally stable and then all of a sudden, boom, you'd just get a big spike. Think about what that then does. It then starts to create demand amplification or bullwhip. And if people aren't aware of these things, the whole thing goes out of control. So there's some papers which are uh, quite highly cited back in 1990, oh gosh, uh, eight, which are around this whole area. And that's really what my doctorate was about. So that was really about, to some degree, risk and resilience. We then, I came to Cranfield and a couple of big events happened in the United Kingdom, which really started to get people thinking about supply chain risk and resilience. We had something which was um, a fuel crisis. So we had uh, a situation where lots of lorry drivers decided to go on strike and not distribute uh, fuel across uh, the United Kingdom. That started to create some real, um, if you like, distress, panic buying and everything else. We also then had 9-11, uh, which shut down air freight. We then had foot and mouth disease, which also had an impact. So all of a sudden, if you like, governments and people started to understand that actually supply chains started to create the you know, various things. And then um, at Cranfield, the Cranfield team under, um, you know, at that time, uh, Professor Martin Christopher, we then got some funding for um, basically uh, by the Department for Transport to look at, if you like, supply chain risk in global supply chains, but also to create some tools that can be used for managing that. And believe it or not, in the last few years, um, last year, we've been circulating those tools. They still hold firm. So, um, you know, we, we can, you know, uh, th those workbooks that were created, we've got them online. And people can actually use them to help them really think through some of the risks and resilience and the things like that. Can Out you, of that, we got various models. Yeah. Can you share me those uh, links and what we'll talk about? I would like to share with the SMD. Yeah, of course. We'll get we, we can get those links to you. They're in they're You know, it's they're pretty open source. So I'll uh, I'll find that for you. And you can also find the link for my doctorate if you're mad enough to want to actually read that. Uh, but I mean, if you think about my work, it goes back, you know, I was using literature from 1958. So this is not new. And I think this is one of the things that everybody needs to realize that there's been researchers working in this area, working on supply chain risk in various forms for many, many years. It's not a new phenomena. So when we get then to, uh, you know, like now, the temple of supply chain resilience effectively came out of some of that early work which we were doing um, you know, in the um, early 2000s um, around supply chain risk. But then it, in a way it became more ad adapted because we started to understand the importance of design 
for supply chain resilience as well, the physical design and also the service design to make things more resilient, which really uh, come into its own. So there was a whole you know, raft of things which ha have actually sort of moved together to, to make that model. So the model's not really that new. Um, you know, I was writing about it a number of years ago, but of course, really, it's, um, it's found its place today for many, many organizations. So it's probably a good idea now for me to uh, try and share, share the model with you all. Please, please, please. Yeah, yeah. here we go. Let's see if we can uh, uh, find this. Yep. It's coming. Right. And yeah, I'm going to be, oh, wow, isn't this great? So, you know, I'm using, we've got the next generation of Zoom here. So I'm able to be on the screen. So you, so I can look at you and you can see this and we'll hopefully you can all see this. So this is, if you like, this temple of resilience, which we've been using. And the base of this is an effective supply chain strategy. So this is absolutely critical for everybody to understand. So if I'm talking about supply chain strategy, you have to understand the competitive strategy of the business. OK, competitive strategy is all about basically how do you create value in the marketplace? It's what does the customer really value? The supply chain strategy is all about how you deliver that value. Right. So it's all about how you deliver that value. So so you've got to have clarity around that. You've got to really have this effective foundation of supply chain strategy. And there's generally in simple terms four boxes that I need to understand. It's the supply chain process design, the, the infrastructure and network and the equipment design, the information systems design, but also very importantly, the organizational design. So the organizational design is, is, is if, if you like all your people and everything else. So you've got to have clarity in that, okay? Then we have to think about the product or service design for the supply chain. So a lot of the risk is built into your supply chain at the stage of, if you like, the product or service design. So if you choose a particular, I don't know, metal, which can only be sourced from one particular location in the world, that will have an impact on the risk profile of the supply chain. Whereas if you can design the product so it can use multiple resources, um, you know, you might be able to use, I don't know, three or four different metals from three or four different um, environments that improves the overall resilience. Then we've got these pillars. So critically, agility. So there's this whole thing about agile supply chain design. Um, you know, at Cranfield, since uh, basically 1999, we've got something called the Agile Supply Chain Research Club, where we've got lots and lots of companies who are members of that research club. Um, and they have been sort of working, uh, you know, they work with us through that. So we've been pioneering, if you like, agile uh, supply chain design, really, really important area, still a very active club at Cranfield. And in fact, we had a, had a forum called the Supply Chain Risk Forum, which was another research club, which actually contributed to this temple. So we, we came up with a concept of competitive supply chain resilience, because if we all know this now, if you actually think about your supply chain resilience, it can gain you competitive advantage. That's one of the big dis things we've discovered in the last uh, 12 months. So agility, we've got to have that. Supply chain collaboration and collaboration managing relationships. Supply chain management is all about the management of relationships. Not relationships can't just happen by accident. You've got to manage them. You've got to put resources into them. You've got to have, you know, potentially even infrastructure and people and key performance indicators around relationships, really important. Supply chain management, uh, risk management, culture, absolutely key. Why? Because you've got to have this culture so that when people make a decision about the supply chain, you know, if I'm going to source from India, or I'm going to source from China, or I'm going to source from the US, how is that going to impact the risk profile of my supply chain? You know, we need everybody in the business asking that particular question. Supply chain uh, design and engineering, you know, that's really picks up on some of the network issues, how you actually design that network. But key with all this, and this has been seen to be really important in the last, uh, last 12 months, is supply chain transparency, getting that visibility um, across the whole supply chain, 
and continuous monitoring and intelligence. So this is picking up on things. So we're finding companies are monitoring social media feeds. They're monitoring LinkedIn. They're also monitoring the US Geological Survey. They're also monitoring weather systems data and so on and so forth. And so if you like the big data analytics involved in that continuous monitoring intelligence and supply chain transparency really comes into play. So these, if you like, this is the temple that we have to build. So when I'm working with, uh, you know, organizations and companies, um, first thing is, is do they actually understand the supply chain strategy? Have they got a supply chain strategy? That's always quite an interesting question. You know, um, who is the guardian of the vision with regard to the supply chain strategy? So some of them, oh, well, that'll be the supply chain director. And then you go and ask them and they go, oh, no, it's not me. Um, uh, that's somebody else. Well, find out in your business who that is. You know, make sure you've got that. Think about the design of product. Now, of course, design a product means this needs to be, you need to be engaged with this at a very, very early stage. So supply chain professionals, you know, get involved with your design teams, your service design teams and everything else. You've got to be able to actually yeah. join in with all that and work with it. So it's really, really important yeah. to oh. make it work. I'm going to spend some time on this because this is a very much important topic for me because I'm an engineer as well. And I, and working in 15 years in the industry, we, I, I don't know when we're doing the new product development, the procurement guys do get involved, but they go to get involved. Okay, this is the product design or the first iteration or the MVP or the prototype or go and find me a supplier and that would be the spec and then RFP, RFI and all this, right? But as you rightly said, let's get involved in the design of it because if we know that, okay, when we talk about product development, you know, regardless if you're in car industry, electrical industry, or, or even aerospace, you, you're going to have a limited bunch of suppliers and you're not going to find 30 more new suppliers. Whatever product you're building, in nine out of 10 cases, you're going to build with your existing supply base, right? Then when I think about this and then I think about why always when the R&D guys design the whole product and then they only get involved or get us the parts, why we are not even involved from the beginning beginning of it? I mean, that, that's one of my questions and a slight complaint. I mean, how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, it is. It's absolutely critical. And I think we've we've even seen this. I mean, um, you know, let's just reflect on, um, you know, part of uh, the challenges of the vaccine rollout. I know that the information systems people, yeah, various big information system suppliers and also the big third party logistics providers were basically um, brought on board and talked to by the, you know, the UK Vaccines Task Force back in early June, you know, they hadn't even got the product. But what they were having to think through is, if, you know, if you think about the challenges of, for example, you know, Pfizer requiring this minus, minus 75, you've got, you know, it's great to basically, you know, be able to create something in a lab, but can you effectively distribute it? You know, the AstraZeneca and some of those other ones are, you know, uh, chilled, which is more manageable globally. So you have to sort of think through, I mean, that's an extreme example, but you have to think through, as I'm designing this product, can it actually, uh, you know, be moved effectively and everything else? Because otherwise it really ruins your cost to serve, to be quite frank. Yeah. So even if you're thinking about, you know, Hewlett Packard and printers, how do you design a product so that it is supply chain friendly? So, you know, if you think about printers, uh, a lot of them in, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, across uh, across Europe, they'll be manufactured in potentially one particular, you know, a big location. But the configuration of that product, the late configuration of that product comes in, you know, at, at a, you know, at the last minute, often in the warehouse, because how do you configure a printer? Well, it's generally software, OK, uh, and power leads. So you want to put those in at the last possible minute, you know, oh, I need a, a Euro plug or I need a UK plug or I need a US plug, right? You know, that might be the case. Or you put them all in there, <laughs> which is also not great for the environment. But, you know, having to think through these things becomes really, really important. And having to think about where, you know, even if I'm looking at, say, uh, electric vehicle batteries, you know, different technologies of lithium ion batteries have different raw materials associated with them and therefore they have different global supply chains and then we have to reflect on what we call ESG risks 
which are environmental, social and governance risks, which is very much a debate which is happening in a lot of boardrooms at the moment. You know, so, you know, you're risk profiling different supply chains around the world. And if you're going into some countries and regions, you might say, whoa, we've got some real uh, uh, you know, difficult risks in terms of social governance. And, you know, do we want to be associated with that? So we're seeing a lot of that type of thing coming out at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to link this uh, base of the product design into one of your pillars, which is the uh, supply chain design and engineering. So let's extend this. So, so while we are either into developing a functional product like jeans or garments or the innovative product could be your know, Apple iPhone, or I would say right now the vaccine itself is an innovative product, right? Never, never done before, right? So why, while we are developing a product, uh, how you suggest that companies should go about in designing the supply chain which fits to that product design, right? I think you already touched base into the you know chill environment, et cetera. But then what I mean by the supply chain design is in terms of, okay, are you going, going to go for a postponement strategy, central DC strategy? What would be your network design? You know, what would be your logistics management design, right? And it's a complicated topic. And I think because it's a complicated topic, you're the best person to actually give us the <laughs> uh, the high level of thought process, where to start. Because I work with multi-billion dollar companies and, yeah. and I know quite a few people who work and talk to, I can assure you that the two are two separate things my, in my experience. Okay. So, I mean, if you're thinking about this, the engineering of it, I mean, one of the first questions you need to start asking is where are your customers? And I think that that's an interesting question to ask. Because, you know, one of the opportunities we've now got with supply chain 4.0, which is, you know, being able to actually, uh, you know, the automation of the supply chain, you know, the digitization of the supply chain is that we're able to actually manufacture, if you like, closer to our customers without increasing the cost, you know. So rather than being promiscuous about labor costs and, you know, moving our manufacturing around to where the cheapest labor is, you know, now we're at a point where actually it may be beneficial for us to actually build manufacturing facilities local to our customers. And in terms of resilience, that's quite important because you start thinking through, can I actually onshore? Can I nearshore? Or as COVID has highlighted, can we multi-shore? Right. So it's not just about having like, ah, oh, I've got three suppliers. I was working with uh, one company recently and they said we thought we, we'd got, you know, we'd, we'd, we had great resilience because we had three different suppliers. Problem was they didn't realize that those three suppliers were all in exactly the same region. And when COVID came, it was completely locked down. So, you know, that's why we're going through and we're asking the question, can I onshore? Can I near shore or can I multi shore? These are attempts to try to actually think about improving the resilience. So if you've got a new product, we can start actually sort of bringing in thought processes like that. Also, from some of the data that we're getting, if we're looking at supply base and some big automotive manufacturers are doing this now, if we're looking at the supply base, what we might actually do is look at where the physical location of that supplier is. And you can do this, you know, Google Maps, you know, satellite imagery, believe it or not, can be utilized for this. And we can start saying, well, hang on a minute, that supplier there, if I look at all the data I've got, they're in an earthquake zone. They're also in a forest fire zone. They're also in a flood area. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how do I want to manage, if you like, risk with regard to that? Because... Do I really want to have a single source of a supplier in an earthquake zone, a, a, a flood zone and a forest fire zone? I mean, just taking an extreme example. But what you might say is, yes, I want to actually plug into that supplier. However, I need to actually think through how we uh, uh, make that more resilient. So it might be that I need to have duplicate tooling being stored somewhere. I might need to carry higher safety stock levels and so on and so forth in case an event happens in the supply chain. So, you know, all those things can start to be factored together just in that, if you like, that procurement decision. So it's linked to the design effectively of the product. You might have the design of the product, but then you might say, well, who has access to this technology? And sometimes you're going to make decisions. We, we have to recognize that people are using now network analysis to, you know, just think about LinkedIn. You know, we're all connected through various people. 
and that enables innovation, you know? So, you know, I'm talking to you, you know, I'm going to learn from you and, uh, you know, we're, we're sharing ideas, so we're going to innovate, yeah? But the point is, is that if I think about my connections, I might want to connect with somebody because they have connections to a different network. And that network can bring innovation into my network. Does that make sense? That's, that's totally so right. sometimes with a supplier, a physical supplier, I might say, actually, that particular supplier, they're a bit more expensive, but they also supply the um, automotive industry. So I'm going to partner with that supplier. Why? Because they can bring some knowledge into my supply chain from the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. And, oh, that supplier over there, they work with the pharmaceutical industry if I partner with them, potentially I can bring that into my network as well. Right. So we get, we're a, you know, the, that whole design area is a complex area, but these are some of the questions that potentially we need to ask. And there's probably a load more, which I've just forgotten, <laughs> but yeah. No, so Dr. Richard, I, I want to take the last 10, 15 minutes we have got, because I know both of us has call in, in 20 minutes. Uh, I want to ask a, a, a real problem right now, which supply chain professors like me are facing, which is very much linked to, your interest, your research, and then going back to your, you know, the, the amplification of demand and things like that. So I recently put on LinkedIn saying, what is the inverse of Bulbeck? So let me give you a background. I, I think it was a crazy discussion because it was just more a punt or a joke. And then I've got 120 comments and some really, really smart yeah. from, from, from you. It's amazing. So let me give you a background what's happening. So when we do demand planning historically, uh, mostly people depend on run rates, historical demand. You can use statistics, machine learning. I don't really care. You try to basically base your future based, uh, future on your historical demand. All good, right? COVID came in and the history, history gone out of the window, right? So basically no history is valid to do any demand forecasting, demand planning analysis, right? Then the, the whole uncertainty around uh, lockdowns and vaccines and huge amount of chaos. And I think you talk about determinative chaos and this is the best case study in a, maybe a century, if not longer, right? So, so the point I'm making is this. Now, the business is the problem they've got is they don't really, history does not matter. They don't really know what customer want. Customer don't know what they actually want. The world needs to move on. The things needs to move. The, the kid's going to go to school. The business needs to manufacture. The, and, and what I'm really seeing in industry that uh, in, in, the, the, in the typical supply chain, again, your user, your dealer, your wholesaler, your distributor, your OEM, and then uh, in, into the upstream of the uh, of the supply chain, everybody's sandbagging because they're too suspicious right now of not to have inventory, not to have stock, not to push the cash in, in the cash of the money. Then what's happening is what I've seen in the last four to six months, the demand is actually way higher than everybody's forecast. Not pick pick any industry actually, unless you are into tourist industry or airline. This forget that. And I'm feeling and hearing and experiencing that. So. With this very long, uh, you know, uh, explanation, my question is this: How we go about as a supply chain professional is try to get a sense of what's happening in the marketplace, right? And being more resilient and agile, given the fact the history and the last twelve months of sales data, so called, is not valid. That am I <laughs> question making sense? Yeah, it does. It makes sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, if we're talking about forecasting, we know there's only two types of forecast lucky ones and wrong ones that's the best way to think about this okay then, so then, so we, we've got lucky forecasts and wrong forecasts this is where i, I generally upset my colleagues at cranfield who uh, specialize in this particular area but uh the the key thing about this is is that you're absolutely right at the moment most of our supply chains are based around forecasting and if you think about demand amplification Effectively, you know, in, in a simple terms, if you're looking at demand amplification or the bullwhip effect, what happens is, is I increase demand on you by, uh, say, 10 percent. You then look at your systems and you've got your internal systems running and you go, ah, I need to increase my safety stock by 10 percent. I also need to think about, you know, this level of stock here. So what I will do is I will place an order on the next person of around 21%. And as a rule of thumb, which I use, if you've got a supply chain where you've got, you know, you're just working it in that way in a very serial manner, you will get a one to 2.1 
increase in demand, okay, between each echelon, each player in the supply chain. So, you know, just with your standard, if you like, uh, forecasting um, algorithms and everything else, generally you're going to get a gearing like that. So, you know, I increase it by 10%, next person does it by 21%, the next person sees about 40%, and so on and so forth. Then they stop trusting what's actually going on, and the whole thing, as we see, just turns into a load of noise. That then creates parallel interactions, because what happens is, is your supply chain then demands everything, so then other people can't get the stuff, right? So then their supply chain is disrupted. So it's a bit like a, a fly hitting a spider's web. You know, it sends ripples out across the whole whole network, and that's what we're we're we you know we're seeing. Those are the the parallel interactions, and I already mentioned if you like the chaos. So how do we start to actually? manage this and dampen all this down um, and everything else. Well, really critically, it's getting that transparency of what the end, the real end customer actually requires, yeah? And the, the problem that we have is many often companies, because they don't trust what's going on, you know, you've got to have transparency because you start playing games. You go, well, you know, um, I need that stuff for Friday next week, but I'll order it for Monday instead, just in case they're late. Or I need a thousand items, but I'll order one thousand one hundred just in case they short us. And I'll also play a, place an order on somebody else just in case they can be, you know, delivered to us a bit a bit quicker. Right. right? And and so you then end up with this whole volatility. And I think that the key thing, therefore, and it sounds simplistic, and I know it's very challenging to do, is to really understand what is the actual true consumer demand and actually communicate that across the network. I was working many, uh, this is, oh gosh, this is doctoral days, you know, this is back in the late 1990s, working with a big automotive company, and uh, they were experiencing, you know, this supplier was experiencing horrible bullwhip, really horrible bullwhip. Basically, because not, you know, there'll be small fluctuations going on, but this was being magnified, as I said, by, you know, one to 2.1 every time it went down. And so we were doing this work on it. And we actually, what the supplier said was, the, the managing director of the supplier did, he decided, I know what I'm going to do is I'm going to go where the customers are. So he went to the car dealership and he basically had a chat with the sales manager at the car dealership that he would, you know, was supplying. And he said, he said, so what's selling at the moment? What promotions have you got going on now? And so on and so forth. And he actually then based his, you know, what he was manufacturing on what the car dealer was doing. And he dampened the whole lot out. Okay. Right. Now, of course, he got some pushback on that. Yeah. But he basically said, you know, are you selling, you know, more of this particular vehicle? Because he knew that he had components in that. And they went. Uh, they went, well, no, not really. Um, you know, so he's going, well, why am I seeing this then? So he would, <laughs> he actually ignored some of what, you know, his direct customer was saying so that he could ensure that they were doing it. But they all started communicating. So really to dampen it out, you need really good communication. Mm -hmm. Okay. So everybody needs to have good communication. You need to get transparency of that, you know, that true end customer demand. Okay. And the bottom line is we've got to collaborate, you know, just, you know, when you get an order and you think that's a bit strange, mm -hmm. potentially push back and say, you know, is this real or, or what you're seeing here? Yeah. yeah. No, and, no, and that's no, a no, challenge. No, no, no. You've got to manage relationships. So I think the second last question before I move to last is this, uh, you have a pillar of continuous monitoring, right? And transparency. So just to expand on this a little bit, what, what do you mean by that and what level of, continuous monitoring you're talking about and how, how actually we should decide with what level is actually good enough. Okay. Well, I mean, if you're looking at continuous monitoring and intelligence, you can subscribe to services, of course. So there's people like DHL, Resilience 360. You can subscribe to that. And what they're doing is they're monitoring their global networks continuously. They're also monitoring other data feeds. And I think it is important that you also need those other data feeds. So for example, you know, if you're looking at, I don't know, it could be a um, union representatives of ports in the West Coast of the US, 
you will see on, you know, open source, because it's there, you can start to see things which are going on. And so some people are actually following these people because they're able to get good insights into some of the things. Also, you know, we've seen an awful lot of stuff in the press at the moment. So data feeds like that. So it's not just quantitative data. It's also qualitative data. Um, which is going on and having people asking the question. So, I mean, we've just had an earth, um, a volcano go off near um, uh, in Iceland uh, next to Reykjavik um, airport. Right. Well, how is that going to um, impact air freight in that part of the world? You need to ask the question. We've got this challenge with the Suez Canal, which is just, uh, you know, is currently ongoing. How is that going to impact what's going on? So you have to be proactive. So often some companies talk about proactive risk management. You get this information coming in, but then you've got to, you know, a supply chain management is about the management of relationships with all key stakeholders to create value for the final customer and reduce costs for everybody. OK, so there's a bit of an academic uh, definition, but it's about managing relationships. So then when you see these things, you've got to go out and start managing those relationships and um, be proactive about it. And I think that that's the key thing about this continuous monitoring and intelligence is as soon as you start to see that things are happening, start, you know, communicating, start collaborating, because generally as supply chain professionals, we can deal with these challenges you know, if, if we're aware of them and be proactive about it's, them. It's, uh, again, the last two, three minutes, uh, I mean, I'm, 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 not, I'm not flattering you, but honestly, I'm a big fan of your work, right? And uh, it's not easy for me to become a fan of somebody's work, right? Well, thank you. Right. So if I take your last two minutes, I say right now in this pandemic, when everything is chaos, one word of wisdom and advice for the professionals, practical, what do you have to say? OK, well, I, I think that, you know, one of the key things with this is you've got to learn to manage relationships. I'm going to go back to that one. It's been about collaboration. It's been about managing relationships and so on and so forth. If you look at it in terms of, you know, it doesn't matter what supply chain we've been looking at it. Those people who have looked at that temple of resilience, they've done the scenario planning, but critically, they've been able to manage those relationships effectively, have actually come out a lot better than those people who have sort of treated their supply partners and their customers as sort of just transactional, um, you know, situations. They've they've really been thinking about that. And I think the next big thing on the agenda we've got to focus on is going to be ESG risks, those environmental social governance risks. We're seeing a big surge with various bits of legislation going around the world. So, you know, be prepared for uh, the new normal, where I was uh, with somebody recently, they were talking about the new better, because I actually, uh, you know, I, I tend to go with that, that this big disruption is, uh, there's a lot of positive which will come out of this for supply chains globally. It's going to, it's forcing us to rethink things. And it's actually meaning that we're going to be able to actually create, if you like, supply chains, which can serve society uh, far better than uh, previously we had, you know. So I, I'm quite optimistic about the future here. So uh, you know, we can move forward with all that type of thing. Um, absolute, actually, very inspiring end, and I totally agree. I think the supply chain will come out better because I think if you can survive a pandemic, you can survive most of the things. So thank you very much for your time. I think an hour or forty minutes will not do a justice. So I am aiming to have you on the show again over the period of you know few months uh, and hopefully we'll talk more and more on this topic because it's I believe we are on the starting end of this whole you know let's call it a positive movement of bringing supply chain to the forte like marketing wars or the you know marketing is or the sub or the finances because I think they have ahead of us in terms of technology and the knowledge content which I think as a supply chain people ask we are not that's my assessment uh, and with that said thank you very much sir it's been a pleasure to listening to you right and uh, honor is all mine. It's a pleasure to talk to you as well. Thank you very much. Okay, guys. So this is end of us. So keep it simple. Keep it real. And if you like what we're doing at SM Dujo, and I'll tag Dr. Richard as well. Please follow him. Follow his newsletter. Amazing content. And like and subscribe for our channel as well. Thank you very much. Uh, cheers. Goodbye. Right. So if you like this video, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and leave your comments below.